Hello, and welcome to another RPD video. Today, we'll be discussing fulcrum lines, indirect retainers, and stress breaking clasps. Removable partial dentures are not fixed restorations. Because of this, they tend to move around during function, as seen here in this animation. As you might notice, much more movement happens on the mandibular distal extension partial denture than on the maxillary tooth bound partial. This is largely due to the fact that there is no teeth supporting the mandibular partial denture distally, which in turn causes rotational movements towards and away from the tissues. Understanding the reason for this movement, its consequences, and ways of management is an important part of removable partial denture treatment. Let's start with understanding what fulcrum lines are. A fulcrum is defined as the point on which the lever rests and on which it pivots. In removable partial dentures, the fulcrum line is defined as an imaginary line connecting the terminal rests in class 1, 2, and long span class 4 RPDs, about which the RPD may rotate. There are two main rotations that occur during RPD function. The first movement is towards the tissues, as the patients bite down on the partial, resulting in apical movement of the denture base. The other movement is away from the tissues, when sticky foods pull the distal aspect of the denture base in a coronal direction and away from the tissues. As mentioned previously, fulcrum lines exist in cases with distal extension like Kennedy class 1 and 2 RPDs, but could also occur in cases with long anterior dental spans like a long Kennedy class 4 RPD. Movement of the partial denture around the fulcrum line can be harmful to the patient if not managed correctly. Movement of the partial denture towards the tissues when the patient bites down on food can result in extraction forces being exerted on the abutment teeth by the clasps. When sticky foods pull the distal extension of the denture away from the tissues, this results in a downwards movement of the anterior portion of the framework that over time can damage the soft tissues of the patient. So, as a first step, let's identify the fulcrum lines on the four basic Kennedy classifications of partial dentures. As you can see here, the line goes through the distal most abutment teeth on class 1 and 2 cases, and through the anterior most abutments on the long span class 4 case. There are no fulcrum lines on class 3 cases as those do not have distal extensions or free end saddles to cause RPD rotation. Now that we understand fulcrum lines, let's talk about how we can manage the consequences of RPD rotation around them. First, let's talk about indirect retainers. Indirect retainers are used to address the issue resulting from the movement of the denture base away from the edential span, which results in the downwards movement of the framework and eventually trauma of the soft tissues. Despite being called retainers, indirect retainers are actually rests that are placed as far away and as perpendicular as possible to the fulcrum line. Alternatively, two rests can be placed as far as possible from the fulcrum line if the perpendicular line falls on a weak tooth like an incisor or goes distally into the patient's throat where there are obviously no teeth. Indirect retainers work to prevent the tissueward movement of the partial denture by creating a hard tissue stop anterior to the fulcrum line. Notice the difference in movement with and without the indirect retainer as sticky foods act to pull the partial denture away from the tissue. So if we go back to our four basic classifications, we will go ahead and project a line perpendicular to the fulcrum line, or two equidistant lines and place our indirect retainers on strong abutment teeth, as far away as possible from the fulcrum line. Now let's move on to understanding what stress breaking is. As mentioned previously, when apical pressure is applied on the distal extension segment of the RPD, an opposing upwards movement occurs on the other side of the fulcrum line that can result in extraction forces on the abutment teeth by the retentive clasp. Let's take a look at how that happens. Here is a Kennedy class 1 case. As you can see here, the fulcrum line connects the distalmost rests of the RPD. In this case, this RPD has cast circumferential clasps on the abutment teeth. The red line represents the fulcrum line, and the blue line represents a line connecting the tips of the cast circumferential clasps. Notice that when the apical forces are placed on the distal area of the edential segment, the clasps existing anterior to the fulcrum line move in an occlusal direction. This is what creates the potentially damaging forces on the abutment teeth. So how do we address this issue? Four stress-breaking clasp assemblies have been proposed to help break or relieve the stresses on the abutment teeth. 
The RPI clasp consists of a mesial rust, a proximal plate, and an eye bar. The same design can be made, but with an eye bar substituted with a modified T-clasp. The RPA or RPC clasp is composed of a mesial rust, a proximal plate, and an acres or cast circumferential clasp. Combination clasp is composed of a mesial or distal rust, a proximal plate, and a wrought wire clasp. Let's take the RPI clasp as an example. To understand how the RPI clasp can break stresses on the abutment, let's start with the configuration that causes the issue, a distal rust with a cast circumferential clasp. The RPI clasp uses a mesial rust in conjunction with an eye bar clasp. This moves the fulcrum line anteriorly so that the clasp tip and the edentulous base are posterior to the fulcrum line. So now when pressure is applied posteriorly, the clasp moves apically and away from the survey line, effectively disengaging the undercut and avoiding extraction forces being transferred to the abutment tooth. This is called stress breaking. And you can see it here in this animation of an RPI clasp during function. Notice how when the patient bites down, the clasp moves downwards and disengages from the undercut. Now let's look at the problem from the lever arm perspective the problem occurs when the fulcrum line is between the edentulous span and the clasp tip. In physics, they call this arrangement a class 1 lever. The problem with class 1 levers is that they act like a seesaw. When the edentulous span moves towards the tissue, the clasp tip moves in the opposite direction, therefore causing excessive stress on the abutment tooth. Stresses can be broken by changing the retentive clasp and fulcrum line relative positions. To break the stress, we must keep the clasp tip on the same side as the edentulous space. In other words, the clasp tip should be closer to the edentulous space than the fulcrum line. In physics, they call this arrangement a class 2 lever. In this arrangement with the RPI clasp assembly, you can see the eye bar clasp moving in the same direction as the edentulous space, thereby disengaging from the undercut and not causing stresses on the abutment tooth. Clasp assembly with a modified T-clasp and a mesial rest works in a very similar fashion. Compared to the eye bar, the modified T-clasp tip is located further distally on the tooth, which is still a stress-breaking class 2 lever. The RPA or RPC clasp also works in a very similar fashion. The RPA is still considered a class 2 lever as the clasp tip exists distal to the fulcrum line. The last stress-releasing clasp is the combination or wrought wire clasp assembly. This clasp breaks stresses a little bit differently. The main mechanism of action of the wrought wire clasp is its flexibility. Despite it being still a class 1 lever, the clasp still breaks stresses by flexing and therefore breaking the transfer of forces to the abutment teeth. An important note here is that this will still work if the rest is placed mesially and the configuration is changed into a class 2 lever. This is all for this lecture. We hope it made sense and we'll see you again in the next RPD video.